through the entire Bible, if you're reading it aright, we are saved by grace through faith, not by works, lest any man should boast. And the Bible over and over and over again tells us how we are saved. We are not saved by our works. We are not saved by any meritorious behavior or acts or deeds, but it is faith in Christ. He and he alone, and this is why when people talk about this, it is incredibly important to get this theologically right. If we're going to look at the Beatitudes contained, they'll be just like those in Matthew. Blessed are usually is the way the statement starts. Um, and so we would begin at Revelation 1-3. So we can, we're going to look at all seven because the seventh one actually is my text. So uh, Revelation 1-3 says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. The next one occurs in Revelation 14 at verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. The next one we encounter is 16, 15, Revelation 16 and verse 15. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. 19, 9 is the next one. And he saith unto me, write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb, and he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Then we've got another one in 20, chapter 20 and verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, and they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And finally, uh, actually number 6, 22 and verse 7, that's number 6, there are 7 I said. Blessed, from verse 7, 22 actually in verse 7, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And finally, the last one, number 7. Blessed are they that do his commandments, and they that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. And I want to stop right there. Most of you know my passion in what I do is trying to find the original intent, what is, what is behind the writer's um, words. We know that all of the writers are inspired by God, but then the question as I'm looking at this verse. There's a big question here. See, if you read the text the way it's written in the King James, blessed are they that do his commandments, you end up with a theological problem. The theological problem is, and it, it is through the entire Bible, if you're reading it aright, we are saved by grace through faith not by works, lest any man should boast. And the Bible over and over and over again tells us how we are saved. We are not saved by our works. We are not saved by any meritorious behavior or acts or deeds, but it is faith in Christ. He and he alone, and this is why when people talk about this, it is incredibly important to get this theologically right. You see, for people who will just simply take this text out of the King James and not even uh, probe into its meaning, you have a problem because blessed are they that do his commandments actually puts you into a works situation. So how do we remedy this? And this is why I wanted to look at these 
um, seven Beatitudes, final Beatitudes of the New Testament, but specifically this one. So the first thing I want to tell you is it doesn't even read that in the Greek. Ha. So when people say to me, well, why exactly do you do translation and why? Well, it's for this very reason. And I want to take a couple of minutes to explain this for people who um, are just coming along, who may be relatively new, uh, or maybe just don't have this portion to be able to understand. We use here in this church, we're using the King James Version, which dates from 1611. And if you follow the history and the development of the Bible, it's really important as anything else, if you're going to follow the footprints of history, it's important to always go back and look carefully at what we know, what we can glean, what are the truths. So we know that the first Greek New Testament of, and we'll say of any uh, real importance, there were other Greek versions, specifically, you've heard me mention many times, of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, but of the New Testament. Probably the most important um, Greek New Testament translation or version would be that of Erasmus done in 1516. And when he did this, he basically used three manuscripts, one from the 11th, one from the 12th, and one from the 15th century. Now the problem with all of this, and this is where for my newer listeners, I have to take the time to explain this. If you're interested, go to my website, www.pastormelissascott.com. You'll find a page that gives you the history of the Bible. You can click. It shows you a timeline of translation. And this is extremely important because a lot of people just come to church and they don't even, when they ask the question, what Bible should I read? They probably don't have any clue of the history of transmission and translation, which lays down an incredible, um, they're like breadcrumbs of history for us. You know, some, I've heard people say this, and it's very frustrating. Well, are these documents reliable? Because you, Pastor Scott, chronically point out the errors. Well, I want to explain a few things. First and foremost, if you think of it, um, we have enough ancient uh, fragments and extant, that's just little pieces and complete, uh, but I'm going to only focus right now on the New Testament. So it is true that we have probably a witness of well over 5,000 fragments and manuscripts that are extant that date back to and go back as far as um, second and third century. And when we talk about the history and the development of the Bible, it's important to understand that prior to the advent of the printing press by Mr. Gutenberg, um, things were copied, as we know, by hand. So if you were looking at manuscripts that date back to a certain time in antiquity, you'd be looking at one version, which is called uncios, which is done in what look like block or capital letters. Minuscules, which look like small cursive writing. Those are really the two uh, compartments we find ourselves in. And codexes, because there was no hard book. There were scrolls that could be then cut and then put in or collated into a codex form, the very, very early version of a book the Bible. Um, but what, what is important is that during the time when prior to the printing press, most people understand and know that copyists copied and made copies of the versions that they had. The problem is this. For the most part, for the most part, we know that the vast majority of scribes worked from one particular copy, and each one was assigned its area, each scribe or each copyist assigned its area. And we know that for the most part, the vast majority of copies are not, as we once thought, perhaps recensions. That's taking uh, a whole bunch of pieces of 
we'll call them fragments, putting them together and saying, oh, look, it, it, they're, they're, they're all kind of the same. For example, it was thought for a long time that the manuscript that is represented by the Hebrew letter A, Aleph, the Sinaiticus, it was thought to be for many years, and the Vaticanus as well, both second and third dating to, we'll call it the third century generously, um, that these were merely recensions, that is that they were revised, but they weren't, because we have enough fragments in, in circulation to compare. Along with that, we have lectionary fragments, and lectionary fragments were essentially texts lifted out and designed to be homilies or sermons that would be preached. So we have enough what we call witnesses to know when we go to look at what is behind our English translation to know whether or not this would be the oldest and most extant example of something. Now, why do I give you all this background? Because even at the time of Erasmus, when he produced his 1516 Greek New Testament, You'd think that, and he was a great scholar, he may have um, some differences in understanding the man's mindset, especially when it came to, uh, ultimately, to the Reformation. But if you follow that first version in 1516, you realize something. It was very pivotal. A little bit later, um, actually a little bit more than later, by the 1600s, about 1633, the brothers L. Zivier, I always say it wrong. I almost think I, I'm dyslexic when I say that. But anyway, um, they produced essentially what would be ultimately a, a recension form of Erasmus's Greek text. Now, why is this important? Because it's from their uh, revision of his text that we get the, the term textus receptus. They were the ones, these brothers, that said, we believe this copy to be the closest to the original and therefore reliable, which came to be known as the Textus Receptus. Now, the problem with this is if we are not careful, we could just stay with what we have in our King James Bible, and we'd end up with a problem. And I found this to be true. When we're treating the scriptures, a lot of times when things seem to be in contradiction, we must go and look at what happened before it was brought into our English language. And there we can find really what we need to best understand the text. So first, let me do this. Let's take a look at what the Greek text, at least a portion of the Greek text, would look like if it was actually written the way it should read. So the top part is what it should read. The bottom part is essentially what our King James reads. And this becomes very interesting. So this word here, which is translated blessed or blessed, and oi, the ones, brace yourself for this, washing, I don't know, does that sound like uh, they that do his commandments? Washing tas, stolas, robes, washing the robes of them. So that's what it actually should read, I'm going to explain. But what it does read is, as you can see here, puontes, that's making, tas, entolas, auton, which is what we have in our text, and it's I, I omitted the blessed part, but essentially this making or keeping the commandments. So let's start first with the handy 26 translation Bible. And for this particular verse 14, we have the following. Um, the ASV, blessed are they that wash their robes, uh, rhymes Bible, happy are they who are washing their robes, blessed will, will they be who wash their robes, happy are those who wash their robes clean. Sounds nothing like do commandments, correct? That's what I thought. 
But it gets more interesting. See, I had to go and probe around. I wanted to schlep out. I have a giant copy of a Sinaiticus in my office, and I wanted to schlep it out here, but I realized, eh, you probably will take my word for it. But if you truly are not certain, we did print this many years ago, the Tischendorf New Testament, which has the King James text, and underneath in the, in the margin it gives you the Sinaiticus, the Alexandrinus, and the Vaticanus, how they read differently. So if you were looking to the Sinaiticus for this very thing, um, I'm going to have the camera come close, and see if you can, I've highlighted, so see, there's the text of the King James, but I want you to look down here because it says SA stands for Sinaiticus and Alexandrinus, are they that wash their robes. So you can see even there the annotation that shows you clearly that it is a different reading than the King James. It gets worse. This is a, um, this is a King James text with the Reina Valera 1960, a Biblia en Español. All right, I want you to take a look at the text right here. So we've got the King James right there. Blessed are they that do his commandments. But look over here. Los que lavan sus ropas. Looks side by side. <laughs> There's a problem there, right? You would, even for somebody who's not a good Spanish speaker, you could look at that and go, eh, I think we have a problem here, right? So I did the same thing with an analysis of the text out of the Coptic Traditionally, I would have written it out on the board for you, but I'm trying to keep this a little bit less taxing linguistically, and I still have to treat the text because there's something here that I would like to show you before I proceed to other explanations. So back to my text, and let's look at this word washing. So we're looking at a verb, which is a participle, it is, that's probably, doesn't look right. It is present and it is active. What does that mean? It means the act of the individuals is constant and ongoing. Present means an act that is started, that is continuous and ongoing. So I can only conclude one thing about how we are to understand this verse. Now, if I'm understanding the Greek grammar properly, it means that this is something that will continue. It's continuous. And there's, we'll have a little bit of help out of the book of Revelation. But what I want to show you first, because I'm going to come back to this. I've kind of put this out here, and I'm going to come back to this. But there is one thing that we can be sure of based on what we're looking at. Many times over in our text, we're going to read about people who have washed their robes or their robes have been cleansed by the blood of the lamb. So it's important to understand the essential meaning of this verse has more to do with people who have trusted and faithed in Christ. That expression of the washing of one's robes essentially is going, we going back to the font daily of Christ that is, as a scripture I've probably quoted every single week in this series, but of 1 John, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse us and forgive us. So we get a picture that the activity is not one of doing or keeping commandments or law. It is none of that. This text, and it is juxtaposed. So we've got those that are faithfully looking to Christ, on an ongoing continuous basis versus if you want juxtaposed verse 15 for without are dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. So there's, there's something being shown to us. Here's this group of people, essentially those that will be in the city and those who are outside the city. Now this is replete with difficulty, I will tell you. Because if you're looking at the whole text, I don't want to get into this now because it opens up another element to be properly uh, translated. But what it is showing us is that those people who are in the city, who can come through the gates and be in the city, 
are those people who have present, active, ongoing, perpetually, constantly, essentially look to Christ. Now, it can mean nothing else than that. And the scribe, it is well um, deduced by most people that this particular scribal error, if you look closely, is this a case of dyslexia? I'm not being funny. You can see we've got here very similar tolas. So is, is it a question of a scribe maybe looking in the wrong place? Or is it deliberate? See, it, it can happen. We've seen this before in many different uh, fragments and witnesses where there's a scribal gloss, there's an error, but usually it's just that, it's an error. This one, most scholars hold to this position, and I do as well, that the copyist copying this particular book, this particular verse, something went off in their brain, even though it looks like, oh, it could be a mistake, but most people, and I'm of the uh, mindset to believe that the copyist probably thought, well, there's got to be something more to make it into the city, so we have to do it as do those that essentially do works, those that keep his commandments. It's a very subtle thing, but this is why I translate and I do what I do. Because I wrestled with this before I actually looked at the translation. I wrestled with this. What could this mean? Actually, I've seen preachers, pastors, ministers do commentaries and sermons and messages on this very text, essentially leading people astray. But I'm going to tell you the message from cover to cover. In, in fact, the last words of John, what are the last words of verse 21? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Not your works and your good deeds and all your efforts. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it is important to really understand what is being said here. There's something also interesting about this in this setting. Remember, I've only treated the first part of this. Blessed are they that are washing their robes, um, that they may have right exousian or exousia um, to the tree of life. And uh, by the gates, let me read my translation because I put it in big block letters in my Bible. Um, and by the gates, they may enter into the city. So several things that I want to treat here. Um, the interesting thing is the reference to the tree of life. I think this is fascinating. Um, the tree of life that appears three times in Revelation. We have the tree of life appearing, of course, in the book of Genesis, and then three times here. One time in Revelation 2.7. In Revelation 2.7, the text to the church at Ephesus. Um, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. That's one. And the two last references are in the 22nd chapter. 22 and verse 2, in the midst of the street of it. And on either side of the river, there was, was there the tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And then, of course, in our text out of verse 14. So I thought it's interesting that obviously for John, there are several things specifically in this verse, but they're being backed up by other references about the washing of robes and about the tree of life, which I can't help it. It brings me to say certain things that are, to me, no longer a mystery, if you will. First. Let's go back to the garden. Let's talk about that for a minute. God said, you can have everything and you'll have dominion over everything. Gave to Adam to name the animals and simply said to tend the earth there. And after the fall, we have God essentially driving them out of the garden to prohibit them from eating of the tree of life, which essentially, I, I, I'd love to just call it what it is, the tree of eternity the fruit of eternity. That makes it so much easier for people who think it's just mere poetry. 
But this tree that God did not let Adam and Eve after the fall eat of was a deliberate act of mercy on God's part. You know, people say God was cruel to drive them out of the garden, but God knew that if they remained there, there was a, a very good chance that they would eat of that tree and they would stay in their fallen condition eternally, which was not God's plan. So I love the fact that if you want to call it the loose ends of the Bible are all brought to a close when this tree reappears. This is, of course, after the thousand years, and now we've got this river that is flowing from proceeding from the throne of God and the Lamb. And then we have this picture of a street, the tree of life, or the, I'm going to call it exactly what I've said, the tree of eternity, or the fruit of eternity. Um, and then a blessing, a beatitude, a final beatitude to those who essentially have looked to Christ, who have kept faithing and trusting Christ on an ongoing basis, that they may have the right. The same word was used of Jesus by John when it says he came to his own, his own received him not, but as many as received him, he gave them the right, the exousia, the right, the authority to be able to be called the sons of God, to become that which God destined, ordained, or desired for man to be. So what is interesting about this text is it tells you something that God will keep repeating all the way right to the end. This, what we're dealing with, is essentially the last word of grace, even though this book, for many people, it scares them. I was talking to somebody this last week, and they said it's frightening. They read this, and they don't necessarily understand but it's frightening to them, the, the battle that's described and the plagues that are described. But it shouldn't be frightening. This is, why, this is what faith is for. If you take God at his word, he says, you who have trusted Christ will not go through tribulation, the great tribulation. And you who have trusted Christ will be safe as those who were in the ark while the rest of the world was being destroyed those that entered into the ark upon God's request were kept safe until the waters abated. So it's important for us to kind of wrap our minds around all this. And there's a sidebar. The sidebar is by correcting the text and making sure that we are reading it right, we are absolutely certain that we are not entering into our eternal rewards, our eternal state, our eternal destiny by any type of work. Now, I have, over the years, my frustration, friends, let me tell you, because people either are sloppy listeners or they have something warped in their brain over 15 years of ministry here, and I have preached for 15 years salvation by faith through grace, not of works. So. A couple of years ago, some couple of ding-dongs who have wax in the ears and a clogged brain, which is probably the size of a mouse, uh, went around saying, Pastor Scott teaches works. Well, I'm still standing here today telling you the messages of grace, not of merit. This is, this is where the Catholics go completely wrong. And I have to explain this because I have Catholic friends that I love dearly that actually started listening, and I want to explain this to you. Never think that what I say is out of hate or some warped ideology or even theology. The Bible continually over and over and over again explains this very thing. Please let me show you, for the sake of my listeners who may not know the scriptures, for the sake of my listeners, many of my Catholic friends, for your sakes, I want to make sure that it's understood and that you're clear about this. We are to build a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We're not to substitute that relation or that relationship by going out and trying to earn our way in by doing, checking the box of all the things we can do. I've said good works to the individual who's trusting Christ. They will come, but they will not come out of a human motivation or out of the mind that says, well, if I do this, this gets me a little bit closer to the door. No, this is just God's spirit in you, essentially 
conforming you to the image and likeness of his son, but never for the sake of saying, I'm earning this, I'm doing this because. Now, if you turn to the Old Testament, and I know this is kind of like a big step backwards, but if you turn to the Old Testament, and that's where I will start, in Psalm 51, and in verses 16 and 17, out of the pen of David, I'm trying to show you that over and over again, even in the Old Testament, God who sees the heart, Psalm 51, verses 16 and 17, For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. So we have a first concept there. Salvation is not by works. Go to the New Testament. I'm showing you things, especially for my uh, longtime folks here, you're all too familiar with, but it's important that we bring along the new people, the new listeners, so that we can all be in the same place. Go to the New Testament in Ephesians uh, 1 and verse 7. And there it says, in whom we have redemption, page 1464, if you have a Bible like mine, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And again, it will say this again in the same book, if you go over to the second chapter, uh, chapter 2 and verse 8, for by grace you are saved through faith and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship. He made me, I am his poetry, I am his craft, I am his by design. Now, I do and have messed up his by design because I have something called free will and so do you. And God knows our frame, but he says, hey, I want to tell you something. No matter how much you think you can whitewash, See, this ties in beautifully. Now, I'm going to say something that is a commentary on the Bible, but it's also a current commentary. If you think that you can whitewash your sins and make revisionist history on yourself, you're an imbecile. Because God says clearly, the books have been open since he spoke your name before the foundations of the world, watching you protecting you from yourself and caring about you. Do you really think he doesn't know where you've been? Do you really think he doesn't know how you have spiritually either evolved or stayed in a stale state, stagnant? You think if God is all-knowing, he doesn't know where you are at spiritually today. So it's important to understand that in this particular case, maybe we start off, many of us start off going the wrong direction. I'm talking about we start off trying to, quote unquote, find God, even though God finds us. But sometimes we start off a little misguided. I started that way completely misguided. I thought that I just had to be a better person. I had to be a good person. And how do you be a good person? Well, you do good things for people. And you, you be kind and you be generous. And all that's wonderful. But if we're talking about salvation, that's not the way in. Salvation is by one method, one means alone. You look to Christ and his finished work. When he said it is finished, he said it is finished for you, for you, for you, for you. He said it is finished for each and every one of us through the ages until the end of time. And he didn't say it's 99% done. Now you got 1% you got to do. He said the only thing that we have to do is take him at his word, trust him, faith in him. So, I've showed you out of the Old Testament. I've showed you out of Ephesians. Now, let me show you a, a different way of explaining this because there will be people who are hardheads, and I know a couple of them. But if you turn to Romans 4, here's another good example that actually blends the Old Testament and the New Testament within the New Testament in Paul's writing, speaking of Abraham. The fourth chapter of Romans. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? 
For if Abraham were justified by works, that is, made right in right standing with God by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, he faithed God, he trusted God, took God at his word, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. It was essentially by Abraham trusting God and taking God at his word, God imputed to Abraham that, we'll call it right mindset, right way, or being in sync with God, having that frame of work or that frame of mind in alignment with God. When it says, for what saith the scripture? Abraham believed, faith, trusted God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. It was his faith. And if you want to talk about Abraham's works, well, <laughs> lying, you know, taking a, another wife, having another child. Just, I mean, let, just leave that alone, all right? But if you keep reading, it explains it. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. In other words, if you think you're going to work your way in, you're making more of a debt for yourself than you are anything because the debt's already been paid by you saying, I don't want that type of debt clearance, but I want to choose it of my own. You're essentially saying, then Christ died in vain. It's not enough. But to him that worketh not, to him that's not trying to do works to make it in, but believeth that trust on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So it's important for us to understand and hope, I, as, I, as I said, I know that my regulars have been exposed to this, but there's a ton of people out there who have not even heard of such a thing. And that they'll, they'll go right back and fall right back into the same mindset, which is, well, I, don't I have to do something? That brings me back to my text out of Revelation 22 and 14. I'm sure that's what the scribe was thinking, but People have to do something. So keeping commandments will help you to make it in. And this is the problem. This is why when people say, well, how come other people aren't looking at this translation? Or how come other people don't do what you do? Well, I, I can't answer that. I can only say that the way my mind works, this is the word of God. But it's also the word of God that has been uh, dealt with in translation and in transmission. And I've said this many, many times. A Bible in English, I really don't care what version you read as long as it's not the Message Bible. I don't care what Bible you're reading, it's still going to be English language. It will be lacking the precision of the Greek. It will be lacking clarity that we have from the way the grammar of the Greek, things that we don't have in our English language. Either we never have them or we don't have them anymore and don't use them. The Greek with its case system and the way I can go through a text and basically morphologically and syntactically take it apart gives us the clarity. And then I have the advantage that other people don't. And forgive me for saying this, but my ability to go in, I only brought a couple of modern manuscripts, but my ability to go in and analyze the texts of something like P46, which is the Chester Beatty Papri, or P75, P75, for example, it's either 75 or 76, papyrus 75 or 76, has the most extent of Luke and John. So if you were looking for the oldest text that is in its most complete form, you'd go to that papyrus. And that papyrus, again, shows you where we may have variations and discrepancies between the text, which brings me to say one final thing on this concept of translation, translation and transmission. It is important. Can you imagine going through the Bible and claiming to open up the Word so we can understand it, we can meditate, we can pray about what we're reading, but we only are using English, and you find yourself almost locked in to either a contradiction, and this has happened to me before. I'm, I'm going to speak for myself, but I'm sure it's happened to you. Have you ever read the Bible? and you find two texts that actually look like they contradict one another. Has that ever happened to you? Oh, okay, then I'm not crazy. A lot of times we'll go in and we'll look at the language 
Now, sometimes I've used Coptic, I've used Ethiopic, I've used Arabic, I've used the, the Syriac Peshitta. I'll use any tool to be able to search out what exactly is being said. So when I show you uh, Revelation 22.14, I'm trying to show you this is another one of these that we've encountered. I could give you another example out of John where it speaks of the uh, first John and the latter, it's either in three or in John, first John, either three or five, where it speaks of the three that are in heaven. That is also a gloss. We know that that had to be a gloss, a later manipulation of the text. Now, somebody listening to me will say, well, but if you're pointing all this out, how can we trust that these documents and this book is reliable? Again, I go back to over 5,000 different when I'm calling them witnesses, they are fragments or full extant manuscripts that reach back to the second and third century. Some, by the way, you've got papyrus that date back to, uh, for example, John writing the Apocalypse. We know that he had to have completed the writing definitely late 90s, 96, 98, somewhere in there. All right. That's, we know that's the oldest of all the writings, the oldest to be canonized and considered part of our Bible. And if you are looking for fragments to kind of support the age or authenticity, uh, you needn't look any further than probably just somewhere in about 170 to 190, we have a fragment of this text, which if you think about it, is within the lifespan of someone who might have been doing transmission and translation. So it's not like people think, oh, well, you know, this, this book has been, um, got to find the right word here. This book has been messed around with a lot. See, you have to uh, watch my tongue, too. This book has been messed around with a lot, right? Yeah, I'm still carnal, friends. Uh, saved by grace, that's all I can tell you. <laughs> but it, it does happen, and we find these uh, many times over, which is why it is vitally important to do the proper uh, translation. So now let me go back to the essence of what I'm driving at from my text. If you will, turn with me to Revelation 7. So Revelation 7, beginning at verse 9, my focus will be verse 13, but to make it a complete thought. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence they came? Now, this is, I said, starting at verse 13. So watch what happens in verse 14. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So you can see, this helps you to understand 22, 14 in its proper translation. And over and over again, actually, if you read through this book, you'll find this washing of the robes. And it's usually washing of the robes in the blood of the Lamb, which to us would almost, as a picture, would almost sound like a contradiction. But we understand the, uh, the essence of what's being reinforced for us. So if you go back to my text at 22 and verse 14, and there is no way that you could read this text any other way than the way I have translated from our oldest manuscripts. Blessed are the ones washing the robes of them. That is on an ongoing basis. That means trusting, faithing, looking to Christ, uh, that they may have the right, the authority to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. So what should we take away from all of this again and again and again? First and foremost, that this uh, book was never intended, it was never meant to drive home 
uh, works, but as you can see, human hands and a human mind that would handle this would bring it right back to, well, it just can't be that you can just trust God and that's how you get to heaven? But that's exactly how you get to heaven. And what does it mean then, if we're going to move away from this do the commandments, keep and do his commandments, what should it mean for people in the now who say are either just starting out or they have been indoctrinated? Because that's what happened to me when I actually, when I first really came to the faith, um, we'll say some 25 years ago, maybe a little bit more, I was still stuck in that well, yes, I trust and I love the Lord and I worship the Lord, but... And it took me a long time. It took me going through the scriptures, even though I knew, but that mindset that conditions you, there's something else you need to do, something doesn't feel right. You mean it's that easy? Yes, it's that easy. That's what makes it that difficult. See, most people, they want to have a checkbox. This is why... And some people may not like what I'm going to say, but I'll say it. That's why a lot of people like a religion that has lots of checkboxes of things that you do so that you don't have to practice, A, an awareness of God, B, trusting the invisible unseen, and three, foremost, above all, recognize that all the work for salvation has been done when you read about the death and resurrection and ascension and ultimate return of Christ. Nothing more to say there. It's faith, period. You trust God, period. The tragedy is as I go through this book and I come to a, we'll call it whittling down to bring something to a conclusion, I recognize something. If I could, why are you going to say, wow, it's, it's more than half of a year, but if I could start over again, on this subject, I'd probably start over with what I would probably finish with. See, it's great to talk about heaven and trusting God. And really, I think for many of us, before I started this series, a lot of us had a little bit of what I call a caricature. You know, you, you kind of have a little bit of an idea, but it's not quite uh, open. It's not quite, you're not envisioning a destination. You're not seeing the whole picture, just a little kind of pieces that you might have heard. I think I've given enough. So then let me put the footnotes here. And whether or not I deliver other messages will remain to be determined by God. I'm going to leave that in his hands. But the things that are missing from here, I'll tell you what they are. First and foremost, let's say if I put it at the back of the book or at the front of the book, if I, if I put this at the beginning of the sermons or the end of the sermons, it is first and foremost faith. The whole book speaks of that. The whole book, we can look at anything from the calling uh, of or Adam and Eve to the calling of the children of Israel to their deliverance. The whole time God was saying, I just want somebody to trust me and take me at my word. Can you imagine going through, as humans, going through life where nobody believes you? You tell people, this is going to happen, or this thing here, and nobody believes you. Imagine now God, who is the creator of all, and you still have people who don't trust and don't take his word at face value. So faith is one. And then probably if I were to put the most important piece apart from all of the other things I've discussed, I would say forgiveness. Faith and forgiveness plus the messages that I've delivered to you are how to make it in. Now, when I say faith, it is that encompasses. It's, it's everything. When I talk about forgiveness, though, there's a reason why I, I, I put that in as a footnote and whether I deliver a message on it or not. Because there's a lot of people who forget what was said in the Gospels by our Lord himself. You know, we've got people that like to read and almost like robotically, they will recite what they call the Lord's Prayer, which is really the disciples' prayer. Six times in there, by the words of our Lord, we are told to forgive, 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 forgive. Why is that so important to God? I mean, listen, do you have to be a busybody, right? Can't I just do my own thing and it, shouldn't it suffice? But the fact of the matter is that God says, no, it's important to me. Let me just read this to you because 
it speaks of something that ties in directly to all of these messages. See, somebody can say, I see now, you've described and you've painted a picture, I see a faraway land that is not accessible in the now, but it will be eventually to me. I see you've talked about a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, new heavens, new earth, and you've talked about the thousand years and what will be worshipped then during the thousand years, and you've also talked about what will be after the thousand years. But all of these things, and through your whole entire Christian life, there will be some concepts here to keep close to you and to understand it matters to God. As much as he has spoken of this subject, people still will recite this prayer as a autopilot, robotic recital of something rather than letting it sink in. When it says, when you pray, pray after this manner, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your tras trespasses. And if you remember, I've taught and spoken on the message of forgiveness. And the only thing that I want to tell you is I found out, in my opinion, from reading this book, there is only one thing that can hinder somebody's faith walk. Now I, I leave the text for a minute to kind of put this in a conclusion status. And that is failure to forgive. You know, when, when we do not forgive, and we're told to forgive not just in, in this particular place, but many times over, as you know, Matthew 18 talks about the same thing. A certain man who owed a sum of money, and I've taught on this before in my message on forgiveness, Ephesians 4 and verse 32, be kind to one another, forgiving one another for Christ's sake, even as he has forgiven you. But why is this important, especially in today's current climate? Forgiveness is a release. It's almost like a house cleaning that lets you have the communication with God without impediment or hindrance. Failure to release something or someone leaves a remnant, a root of bitterness is what the scripture calls it, that gives it time to fester and grow into something more which will eventually hinder you in your faith walk. And that's why I said it's important to put all this together as one package where people might say, well, you've, you've spent 30 messages talking about what it will be like and how it will be and how we'll get there. But the one thing I want to make sure we understand can have a vision of a destination of heaven and kind of like in the flesh. Let's just take some, an example in the flesh. You could have a vision of, uh, I dream of taking a vacation to Hawaii, but the method of transport is unknown to me and I may come up with something that can't actually get me there. Like, I know I'm going to get to Hawaii by taking an umbrella, turning it upside down, and uh, navigating it on the water as I go, like a, an early paddleboard or something. Not, all right? My point is, that's the mindset that we should be looking at. We understand what I've described as the kingdom of heaven, new heaven and new earth, a new Jerusalem, the celebration of the saints. And I've told you, the answers are in the book. And I think I can, I can pull from many different examples, the difference between people who will trust the Lord. You remember Naaman, who had been covered with leprosy. And what was he told to do? He was told to go and wash how many times? Seven times. See, numbers are important. You know, he went down the first time, nothing happened. The second time, nothing happened. The third time, nothing happened. God said seven. He didn't say six. He didn't say six and a half. He didn't say six and a quarter. He said seven. And on the seventh time when he came up, the leprosy was gone. Now, I don't know about you. I haven't seen the incredible miracles and signs like we read of in the Old Testament. What I have seen, though, is I have seen people who were not looking to be changed and they were transformed by the word of God. I have encountered and met people who 
were out there in the world and then, again, not, not trying to become a Christian. So don't paint this as a painful experience or something you've got to work at. If your heart has been open, your mind will be open to receive this word and recognize something. God wants, he wants his creation to look to him. But that's also why he gave free will, because he's not wanting the pseudo. This is why that, that other verse that comes right after 22.14, 22.15, that says uh, uh, seven, d seven descriptions, seven sins, seven, seven types of people who are out of God's grace. This is why he makes the juxtaposition. Why? Because the simplicity in which we make it in, I don't know who wouldn't want to trust and take God at his word. So I'm not sure what we will, if, if I'm going to say this brings the series to a close or not, but for today what I want you to think about is the fact that we are recipients of God's grace. We are fortunate above most people to be able to open up the book and recognize we're able to read and understand what's there for us and then be able to stand up today and say, salvation by grace, straight to the end, that's how I'm going to make it in. And if your mindset when you have been listening to me is, well, how can that be? I'm going to tell you something. There's an expression in the bodybuilding world, because I'm, most of you know I like to, I'm fascinated by that universe, and th there's an expression that people toss around called trust the process. I'm telling you, Trust the process. Very simple. As you start reading it, as you start recognizing this could not, this whole book could not be penned by human ingenuity, but by God driving and directing the drama, the unfolding of the redemption of his creation. And you get to the place where we're at, you recognize God says, I have not changed. I am still the same. The way to get in is faith. You keep trusting him along the way. Will you falter? Will you step to the side? Will you maybe have times when you've been walking in the flesh, but you meant to be walking in faith? Absolutely, that's the life of faith. It's not perfect. In fact, probably for those of you today who start trying to commit to a life of faith, you'll find in some respects it becomes more challenging. Why? Because the whisperers will be like, well, shouldn't you be doing this? Shouldn't you be doing a little bit more of that? Instead of just saying, I walk by faith, I will take him at his word. I have no reason to doubt what he says is true. And I will, like the rest of you, stand on that place. I don't want to call it a faraway shore. I don't even really know why we say that. It's going to be right back here on earth where we all stand together as a family of God. And when I say, as I said last week, no more curse, which means no more tears, no more death, no more disease, but a life of perfection and perfect communion with God. Now, do you think that's going to be boring? Because some people think it's going to be real boring. <laughs> but from what I've read about God, I don't think there's anything boring about him. And I think he's got a good plan for those that trust and love him. So I'm going to do the one thing I know to do, which is take him at his word. I pray you do too. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.